Welcome to Stepping Out, Early Childhood Education for Earth Day and Beyond. If you've made it, you're in the right place, and we are so happy to see you. So we're going to continue to welcome folks as we go through some opening slides here. So thanks again for joining us this afternoon, evening, or morning, wherever you may be. Go ahead. Let's get started. Welcome again, everyone. And as you're logging on, we just wanted to ask you to please take a moment to rename your user just by double clicking there so you can add your name and also the state where you're joining us from and also any pronouns that you might like to use. We do have an engagement question for the chat if you do that. Please feel free to check the chat. We'll be doing a lot of interaction with you guys. It looks like we have over 100 people logged on, so please feel free to chat with us. We are going to be using that to communicate the whole time, so make sure to pull that up so that you get lots of links and questions and things to consider. So we have a question for you. What is a favorite memory of being outdoors? So you can think and reflect on that as I introduce our team. So hi, I'm Jacqueline Stallard. I'm currently serving as a curriculum advisor for the Sustainable Forestry Initiative and Project Learning Tree. I am joined by Christy Merrick, we're co-hosts here with the Natural Start Alliance. She serves as the director, and we are so happy to be partnering to bring you some resources for early outdoor education with your little learners. Our heart of our webinar is our two practitioner presenters we have here at the left. Tarnisha Evans, who's joining us from Virginia, and Sheila Williams-Ridge, who's joining us from Minnesota today. With that, I wanted to offer a territorial acknowledgement as a way to recognize Indigenous peoples as right owners and stewards of this land from time immemorial. Each of us will share our own individual land acknowledgement. So with that, it is with profound reflection that I offer up my own personal one. Acknowledging Hawaii as an indigenous space whose original people are today identified as Native Hawaiians. The aina, or land, on which my family resides is located on the Ahapuaha of Waikiki, in the Moku of Kona, on the Mokapuni of Oahu, in the Pai Aina of Hawaii. I further recognize the generations of indigenous Hawaiians and their knowledge systems shaped Hawaii in a sustainable way that allows me to enjoy her gifts today. For this, I am truly grateful. So thank you for being able to share that. And with that, I want to share our outcomes and agenda for today. First and foremost, we want all participants to be able to go outside and to take little learners there. So we want you to be able to engage people straight away. You're gonna be walking away with resources and ideas and things to implement right from the start. So that ties into our second bullet here which is to experience some of these things. Not only will you learn about them, but you'll get to hear about how they unfold in practice from people in the field. So that's what we wanted to do today was connect you with people who are out there working with little learners outdoors so that you can feel empowered to do the same. Here's a little bit of an agenda laid out here for you. Our guest speakers will start around quarter past the hour. We will have time for Q&A at the end. So feel free to drop your questions in the chat between now and then. I know there'll be some time for that at the end, but don't log off at the very end because that is where we will be sharing all of the resources. And if you are registered for this webinar, because you're here today, you are, you will be receiving all of the resources afterwards. We're doing a recording. We will also post links on the website. So you will receive follow up with all of that information made available to you. So don't worry. Okay. With that, we want to start with a little bit more of an engaging question, we have a poll for you, and it is based on a project learning tree activity that is tried and true. We call it values on the line. And what we're going to do is launch four statements for you to read and consider. And you'll have to scroll down a little bit, but you'll have to read each statement and then rank each statement from one to five. And so one being, as you can see on the screen here with our little emojis, is maybe not so comfortable, not so confident, not so sure. And then five being, yes, 1,000%, I'm totally on board and comfortable with that statement. And then two, three, and four being somewhere in between. So we do have four statements for you. So we're going to go ahead and pull them up on the screen now. So you can be able to have a pop-up box, hopefully, where you see the statements. 
Number one, I'll just read them for you while you go ahead and answer. I have positive early memories associated with being outside. So again, you could rank that from one to five. I can see some answers coming in. You guys are getting this. This is fantastic. Number two, early childhood experiences with nature have the power to create a commitment to protecting the environment as adults. What do you think about that? One, maybe not so sure. I don't think so. To five being yes, absolutely. And two, three, and four being somewhere in between. Number three, I like the idea of incorporating outdoor education into early childhood programming. That seems like a no brainer. But number four, I am equipped to do so. So to integrate that outdoor education into my early childhood programming. So question three is you like the idea, but question four is you feel like you can really do it with confidence. Yes, we still have people signing on. Welcome. We're doing a poll right now. I have seen so many states from across the US. Thank you for joining us. I think most people have answered, Jackie, so I'm going to end the poll and share the results. Thank you, Emily. OK, you should all be able to see the results as well. I'll just spend a minute looking at them and talking through. Most of us do have positive early memories with being outside, but not all of us. Um, so that's very interesting to consider where we all come from when we come to this work. Number two, yes, most of us do believe, almost 80% believe that these young experiences will carry over into adulthood. And Natural Start is going to actually share some research in just a little bit to support some of these notions so that we can have some studies to back up our claims. Number three, yes, 95% of us love this idea, but only, what, 75% of us feel like we're confident or fours or fives on the scale. And so how can we move some more of you that might be, uh, you know, a zero, one, two, or three uh, over to that tipping point for, for four and five. So we really hope that you walk away with some resources to get started as we consider April as Earth Month and working uh, to put together activities and events for something um, to get ready for Earth Day. So thank you for your participation. And now I'm actually going to pass it over to Christy, who's going to share some resources from Natural Start. Hi, everyone. Um, again, I'm Christy Merrick. I'm the director of the Natural Start Alliance. We promote nature and outdoor learning and early childhood education. And we're a project of the North American Association for Environmental Education. Um, NAAAW is based in Washington, D.C. I'm coming you, to you today from South Florida. Uh, South Florida has been the traditional homelands of the Tequesta and Calusa tribes, uh, and today is the sovereign homeland of the Seminole and Mixuki tribes. Um, so, um, as Jackie said, my focus uh, for the webinar today is to help make the case for nature and outdoor learning. Um, but we don't have a lot of time, and I'm thinking that since you're here, you probably are already convinced that this is something that's important and good for children. Um, next slide, please. But we do find that a lot of the people in our community need uh, research that backs them up when they're trying to advocate for this. Um, maybe you're trying to admit, uh, convince a colleague or an administrator that this is important or trying to find funding for your program. So I want to just point you to a couple of resources that are available through Natural Start and NAAAE that could help you um, that way. Next slide, please. So the first thing I wanted to show you is um, a project called EE Works. This is a program where NAAAE has worked with universities to really dig into the research literature about the impacts of environmental education. The field is really big, so there were separate studies on different areas of education, like K-12 or climate education. Um, but one of the studies looks specifically at early childhood uh, environmental education, or as we more often call it, nature-based ed education. And that research was done in collaboration with uh, researchers from Stanford University. They looked at hundreds of studies um, of nature-based programs, and um, they found that these programs are really varied in the ways that they uh, engage children with nature and the environment. The most common strategy that they found among programs was spending time in nature. 
not surprising, <laughs> but you can see here on this slide that there were really a variety of ways that programs can do this. Um, and next slide. Uh, and then when they looked at the outcomes of these programs, it was really clear that education, um, nature-based education, really promotes uh, children's development. The study showed um, that there were really positive outcomes in a variety of areas of child development. You can see social and emotional, cognitive, physical, language and literacy, environmental literacy. So we think this is really strong science-driven evidence that nature-based learning really benefits the whole child. Um, so if this is something that you think could be helpful to you, we can share these exact slides. Um, we can also share a PDF that uh, has a summary of this research project. And if you really want to dig in, we can also share um, probably in the chat and also in um, with the recording. Uh, a link to the actual research study that was published in the journal. Um, can we go to the next slide? So that um, EE Works project um, really did a lot of the heavy lifting for you in terms of sifting through the research to make the case. But if you want to look for individual studies on your own or there's something specific that you want to find out um, in the research to back what you want to do, I really recommend this EE Research Library. Um, you can access it through the NAAAE website. Um, and I think we can provide a link in the chat um, for you now. Um, this uh, tool was developed jointly with NAAAE and the Children and Nature Network. Um, and it's a database that's just filled with the research resources of both organizations related to uh, connecting children to nature. Um, so you can search by keyword for your own thing that you want to find. There are um, kind of preset research categories that you can search through. So it's a really terrific research that, uh, excuse me, resource for research that I uh, recommend that you check out. And more research is coming out all of the time. Um, we share a lot of research through Natural Start on our social media channel. So if you want to kind of keep up to date on what's coming out in support of nature and uh, early childhood education, please do connect with us at Natural Start. It's free to join. And um, that way we can stay connected and keep you up to date. We also publish um, the International Journal of Early Childhood Environmental Education. And we update members all the time when that's coming out. So another good reason to stay connected. And on my last slide. So the last um, resource that I wanted to highlight uh, for making the case is the Nature-Based Preschool Professional Practice Guidebook. Um, it's a resource that we created to uh, really define what makes the nature-based approach to early childhood education unique, and the introduction to the guide um, has some helpful information that kind of summarizes everything, and it includes some really great information that helps make the case. So you can download that for free from the Natural Start website, the introduction piece. Um, and I just put this um, extra piece up here to highlight that later Jackie will talk about a really wonderful resource that Project Learning Tree worked on that shows the um, correlation between the guidebook and the trees and the guide. So I feel like that's a perfect place for me to stop um, and hand it back over to Jackie so she can tell you some more about the trees and the guide. And then Tarnisha and Sheila will show you some of the activities in action. Thank you so much, Christy. Lots of great resources right there. And again, they will be all recapped for you later, but hopefully you're able to tag some right now. I did want to talk about the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. It's really the backbone of Project Learning Tree, and we have a vision at SFI. It's of the future of a world that values and benefits from sustainably managed forests. So our education all goes back to trees for us. And we have a mission that supports that vision. It's to advance sustainability through forest-focused collaborations, which is why it's so essential and important that we are up here with Natural Start Alliance today. So thank you for making that possible. Next slide, please. Project Learning Tree has a singular goal to advance environmental literacy, stewardship, and career pathways using trees and forests as windows on the world. We do have one more quick poll for you guys. We just want to know if you were familiar with Project Learning Tree prior to this webinar. So there's just three options for you. Just know I was not familiar. Yes, I had heard about it. And then yes, I have participated in attended PLT events or used PLT activities before. So thanks, I see lots of people jumping in now. Um, and about just as many were not familiar as have engaged with us. And then we have uh, some in the middle, but some results are still coming in. 
So that's great. It just helps us to know where you're coming from, especially as we continue to send out follow up and communications, how we can best engage with you. All right, so I think now everyone can see uh, almost 40% was not familiar at all and 40% has engaged with us. So the first and the third option are almost equal there. And then the remainder is, is somewhere in between. You've heard of Project Learning Tree, but maybe haven't engaged before. So excellent. I see some great conversation in the chat about outstanding educators and different awards as well. So wonderful. Thank you for your commitment to environmental education and Project Learning Tree specifically. Uh, my next slide, please, just to show our reach. Uh, these are 22, 20, 22 numbers only. Through our programs using nature and environment to teach, we estimate that last year alone, we reached approximately 2.2 million youth. We do this through professional development events, such as this one in person online, where we reached 11,000 plus educators, caretakers, and natural resource professionals just last year. And that's through 500 or more professional development events uh, that we recorded just in 2022 alone. PLT actually has its origins with the very first Earth Day uh, back in the 1970s. We credit our program with launching around the year 1976. And since the program's inception, we, we estimate that we have reached about 145 million students. So we are so happy to bring those of you into the fold who are, are new to PLT and our programs today. So with that, I'm going to introduce our guest speakers so you can see a little bit more of how Project Learning Tree works on the ground. We do have an engagement question for you. We're gonna post in the chat to think about how you have engaged children in outdoor learning in the past while I introduce our two panelists today. First, we're gonna hear from Tarnisha Evans. She is an experienced educator and advocate for nature-based early childhood education. Previously, she was a children's program developer for the US, Lewis Ginter Botanical Garden in Richmond, Virginia. And in 2017, Tarnisha was awarded an outstanding educator by PLT. She teaches art at the Visual Arts Center and Cultural Arts Center of Glen Allen in Virginia. And not only is she an award-winning educator, but her joy of teaching young children is obvious and contagious, as you will see. I am also gonna introduce Sheila now. Sheila Williams Ridge is co-director of the Child Development Lab School at the University of Minnesota. Sheila has experience as a business manager and preschool teacher naturalist. She teaches now a wide array of early childhood courses at the University of Minnesota and Hamline University. She is a facilitator for the NAEYC Young Children in Nature Interest Forum. She's on the Voices and Choices Coalition. She is a board member for the Minneapolis Nature Preschool and Dodge Nature Center. And she is a member of the Natural Start Alliance Council. So very appropriate for you to be here, Sheila. Thanks so much. Last but not least, she is co-author of the book, Nature-Based Learning for Young Children, Anytime, Anywhere, on Any Budget. We are so excited to have you both join us today and to be able to hear experiences from both of you. So with that, I'm going to ask my friend and colleague, Tarnisha, are you ready to begin? I am ready, Jackie. So should I just start? All right. So. Hello everyone, thank you for being here. I want to start with a joke. I'm not a comedian, but I'm going to start with a joke. My joke is, how do you catch a squirrel? You guys can respond in the chat. And I will go ahead and tell you what the answer is. Climb a tree and act like a nut. You get it? Ha ha, it's not funny. Okay, so I'm not a comedian. I am going to go ahead and stick to being an educator. Um, but I figured this joke would be a great segue. <laughs> this joke would be a great segue to our activity, Home Sweet Home. So Home Sweet Home, um, the overview is just on the screen for you. Children discover how plants and animals depend on trees. And there's a prompt. And you guys can, I'll read it and you can read it along as well. Do you think trees, living and dead, are good for wildlife? Um, you can even give me a thumbs up. Yes. Okay. 
Why or why not? You can answer in the chat. And while you guys are answering in the chat, I'll go ahead and go through some bullet points that I have. Um, trees like oak and sweet gums are a good source um, food for birds and squirrels. Squirrels and birds may be the most common, but other users of standing and falling trees may surprise you or not. You have mammals like raccoons and bats, amphibians like tree frogs and salamanders, uh, reptiles like snakes and lizards. Evergreen trees like pines and cedars protect birds from cold winter winds. Large hollow trees may even shelter black bears as they sleep away the winter months. Next slide. So in our Trees and Me guide on page 117, I think it is, no, 110, um, it talks about snags. It's in a section called Background for Adults. So snags are basically standing dead trees that provide habitat. So tree frogs and beetles live under a snag's bark. Um, we have woodpeckers and other birds that feed on insects that live in the snags. Chickadees nest in cavities created by the woodpeckers. Squirrels and deer mice store food in them. And as you can see, there's a did you know fact on here. On each In each activity, there is a did you know fact. Um, and you can read that one. But I have a Tarnisha did you know fact. So did you know? that blue jays do the same thing with acorns that squirrels do. They hide them in snags and trees. Did you know that? Next slide. So if you are intrigued by, by the snags um, or just want to know any more about them, there is a seven page document that I think is going to be, okay, the direct link will be in the chat. Please, please feel free to read this document. It has much needed information, um, very useful information um, in reference to snags and the importance of them in your neighborhood. <laughs> All right, next slide. So the free exploration is on page 17 in the guide for home to home activity. There is a free exploration section for each activity and in the in the free exploration activities this section provides a, independent learning activities includes art and dramatic play and outdoor play next slide so we're about to show you guys some photos of Virginia wildlife. And for each photo, please take the time <clears throat> and answer the question in the chat. What do trees provide for these animals? And we'll start with the first two pictures that you see. So the first picture is brook is um, a school of, or a few brook trout fish. The second picture is minks, some Virginia minks. All right. Next slide. Next pair of pictures is this king scarlet snake and that looks that a spotted salamander. The next slide. So here we have two different types of birds. We have a scarlet tanager. Then we have a yellow warbler feeding her babies. So, so these photos actually were courtesy of our Virginia Wildlife Calendar, and they came from our wildlife education, our statewide wildlife education coordinator, Courtney Hallinger here in Virginia. But if you, I highly recommend that you guys reach out to your local wildlife 
organization where you live and reach out to them and ask them for some old publications such as calendars and magazines. I'm pretty sure if you tell them what you want them for, they will happily give them to you. But again, that is where these photos came from. Next slide. So other ways that you can use these photos um, would be you can put them in to a center and let children investigate them, investigate how animals depend on trees. You can put them in your art center, have children draw or sketch them. You can have children pretend to be wildlife bi biologists. And if you see right here at the bottom, explore careers. I don't think it's ever too early to introduce children to green jobs. So in each section or each activity of the Trees and Me Guide, there is um, there will be a section about green jobs for each activity, which I think is a great, which is a great way to introduce children to green jobs. Next slide. What's the connection, right? How do animals that live in and around a tree use it? How might the tree be helped or hurt by organisms that live on or around it? So the next time you guys pass by a tree, just think about it. Um, what about this chewed this chew leaf um, or a plant growing on a tree, animals on a tree, or a hole in the trunk or the base of a tree? a nest or birds flying around the tree. Next slide. So there are a lot of PLT resources available online. Here are some examples. And the tree observation bingo from the previous slide is another example. So you will have to create a free account and I think you could just use this, what you see on the, the website that you see on the screen. And Jackie will tell me yes in the chat if I'm saying the right thing. Next slide. All right. So my time is almost up, but I will end with a reflection from this book, Forest Baby Retreat, Find Wholeness in the Company of Trees by Hannah Fries. So you are here at last among the trees. Whether you are in a city park, town, trail system, state forest, national park, or private woodland, whether the acreage you stand on is large or small, whether the trees are towering, old giants or young upstarts, whether you can hear traffic nearby or not, whether you are with others or alone, whether it is hot or cold, rainy or sunny or snowing, whether you are in shape or not, whether you know anything about trees and wildlife or not, you are here with us and among the trees. So next slide. Again, I'm going to check with my friend Jackie to make sure that I'm giving you guys the right information about this slide. So I think so this is going to be some sample pages for Home Tweet Home, and I think it's going to be in the link. Am I right, Jackie? Yep, she said yes. Yep, direct link, direct link in the chat. In the chat. Yep. Next slide. So we will have questions. We will, Sheila and I both will answer questions at the end. But now I have the honor to introduce Sheila Williams Ridge. And I am a major fan, everyone, just as much as you are. So it is my pleasure to introduce Sheila Williams Ridge. Hello, everyone. I'm not sure if you can see me yet. Hi. Uh, it's so nice to be here. Thank you, Tanisha, for sharing that. And I'm so excited to talk to you about my section because it's really just going to build on this. 
Um, it's one thing that I love about this Trees and Me booklet is that each section continues to build on the section before, so you can just continue to do more meaningful things with young children. So uh, I'm coming to you today, surprisingly, from the land of the Hawaiian people. I'm here at a school studying um, Hawaiian language immersion because we're working on a Dakota language immersion program uh, here at my school. I don't know if the slides are gone. I don't see them anymore. Um, I'll just keep talking. But um, but the section that I chose is uh, the uh, activity 12, which is three cheers for trees. And it's just a way to celebrate trees. So I'm very excited to think about um, all the ways that we can do that. And um, so I started with um, the goal of that section is to respect and appreciate the importance of trees in our lives. Right, that builds on Tanisha's section of thinking about how plants and animals depend on them. Uh, Three Cheers for Trees, Activity 12, really focuses on how we are um, celebrating and respecting and appreciating the importance of trees in the lives of us as human beings. Um, Anna, is the, are the slides coming back up? Okay, it's okay. Um, we'll, we can move through them pretty quickly. Sorry, I'm having some issues here, um, but that's we'll okay. Oh, uh, I could share my screen. If I've that's got helpful. it. I've got it. Okay, okay great. <laughs> One second. Uh, so normally I'm coming to you from Dakota land, um, Minnesota, now known as Minnesota. Uh, I teach uh, at a uh, lab school. I'm uh, the director there or co-director there. And then I also, during the summer, I teach a nature fo focused, nature focused program for children outdoors. All right. So um, once she, she's going to catch up to the slides really quickly. Um, I just put some beautiful pictures of trees because I mean, besides puppies, I feel, feel like pictures of uh, wildlife and, um, and trees are among the most beautiful. So I chose a few different ones. So this one I was talking about the goal. And the next thing I wanted to talk about is just, you know, like that we, there's a saying, this is from a giving thanks poem that I have hanging in my office. Um, many different cultures, and I even know some preschool programs that do a daily thanks to the nature around them for all the things that it brings to us. And so I just took the section out from ours um, that is about the trees. And so to the trees for shelter and shade, for fruit and beauty, greetings and thanks. Um, I went to a program yesterday and they do a greeting similar to this to nature every time they go um, out on a walk into the space. Uh, it's such a way to kind of center your being, but also just thinking about um, what a gift nature is to us in our lives and how we can uh, both respect and show appreciation for it. So I'm going to just go through a couple of these. Uh, it's kind of what the chapter is all about. The next section or the next slide is about shelter. And when we think about shelter, sometimes we think about shelter just for us. But shelter is a home for, you know, like Tarnisha mentioned in hers, um, a home for wildlife and, and us as animals. We depend on the things that trees give to us. So really in this section of the book, uh, it's important to think about the ways that we protect trees as well as they uh, protect us by giving us shelter. So we talk with children about what wood is and, you know, that wood comes from trees and that the tree does have to die to give us wood. So we want to make sure that we use that wood in a very meaningful way. And, you know, as they were talking about earlier, a big part of this is sustainability. So how the sustainable forestry, forestry initiative is really focusing on that this is something that can last us forever for ge many, many generations if we take care of it properly. So we, uh, we get excited to show children the process of woodworking, you know, for very young children, you know, twos and threes and fours, they can do really simple things, hammering, you know, maybe a little bit of soft sanding. And as they get older, they can really start to build things. And one of the first things that children really love to build are birdhouses. Um, and, you know, depending on where you are, there might be things that are more appropriate if you don't have, you know, birds that nest in, in that way. I grew up in Las Vegas um, and we didn't have a lot of ne tree nesting birds. A lot of them, you know, nest in bushes or in the ground. Um, so thinking about the, the ways that you can use wood in your program. Um, in the book, Trees and Me, there are so many examples of 
wood products. Um, so, you know, tree products, so wood, including wood, food, paper, um, but also those kind of intangible things. They're tangible to us um, in a way, but like clean air um, or places to climb, uh, home for wildlife. Those are important things that we, um, that we want to make sure to incorporate too. Um, and then talking about homes with children and the importance of homes and how many homes we need, right? In many of our, you know, neighborhoods, there has been a boom of more and more construction. They're building these big apartment complexes. And, you know, and some of the children may start to notice that there are fewer trees in, the, in those spaces because they've put up these large structures. So, you know, helping children advocate and, and think about what they can do to provide more shelter uh, for spaces uh, in your neighborhood is a really kind of important next step for children to to take that knowledge and to to build it forward. You can go to the next slide. So the next slide is you know shade and shade is so important and these are just a few headlines. I just went online and found some headlines about um, the importance of having shade and how do you talk with young children about you know the importance of shade. I love there's an exhibit at the um, uh, at a place in, in Las Vegas, and they do a wonderful thing where they have an iguana um, that is uh, in the sun, uh, that's painted black, and it's in the sun, and then they have one that's painted white, and they're both in the sun, and they have you touch them and see which one is hotter. And uh, it's a wonderful way to just show children the importance of shade, right? If something is in the shade, it's going to be cooler. Um, and and I love that um, that we can provide really simple ways for children to, to do that uh, in their own program. So it can help our school by, by having shade up um, and planting trees is a really wonderful way to get to that. Um, when children say things like, our playground is so hot in the summer, you can add things like, well, if we could plant a few trees, where, what would we plant? We can take a walk through the neighborhood to see what kind of shade different types of trees give us. And we can start to make decisions about what we might like to see in our play space. So I think it really gives children a place to problem solve instead of um, just being sad or, or upset about the lack of, um, of trees in the space or about the, the heat. Um, and trees and vegetation, they are you know, just so good at lowering surface and air temperatures. Um, and they, you know, can help keep uh, moisture in, especially in places that are, um, you know, uh, experiencing drought. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, and so the next one is, uh, so this is an engagement question for the chat, but do you have uh, trees that grow fruit that's edible in your area? And how can you help children uh, connect with those trees and celebrate them? So in our area in Minnesota, we have a lot of oak trees thankfully. And sometimes, you know, we, the children watch the squirrels gather, um, gather acorns. And, uh, and so the children also want to gather acorns um, just to, to play around with them. And they had their um, stuffed squirrels out there gathering those things. Uh, and then we also have apples, which, uh, which we're so fortunate to have. And if you have a chance to walk uh, in an orchard you know, through the seasons or, or any place where fruit grows on trees and just talk to children about the importance of, you know, um, each blossom, right, has the opportunity to become a whole fruit and how amazing that is uh, that every single flower, because sometimes when you look up at a tree, you're like, there's no way there will be that many apples on this tree. But, you know, if you don't have a big windstorm and if you have really healthy pollinators. And if you don't have a ton of rain come down and knock the blossoms off, it is really amazing to see what a tree can produce and the ways that children can, you know, connect with them and learn and watch that flower kind of grow a little tiny green apple and then just continue to grow is, is really, really wonderful. So, um, so it sounds like people have some really amazing trees. I can only see every now and then something pop up, but someone has mangoes uh, and that's pretty great. Where I am right now, they have, um, they have passion fruit and that's a lovely thing. So I try and knock them down. They're, they grow very, very high in the tree. So it can be a little bit harder um, to, to grow. And thinking about the, the food as not just food for human beings, but also food for wildlife. And, um, and so having some fun with that, putting stuffed animals outside that represent the wildlife that children can't you know, just go up and touch um, so that they can really embrace the lives um, and the importance of those animals in the ecosystem with you. You can go to the next slide. Uh, and the last 
part of that giving thanks poem was about beauty. And I think about beauty, not just in the aesthetic sense, but beauty as kind of uh, an excellent example of something, right? Like what a beauty. Um, and just that it doesn't always have to be that it is aesthetically pleasing, um, but that it is multifaceted, that it has it's a complex kind of set of things that it brings into our lives. And so, um, you know, focus on what beauty the trees bring in your area. Um, like I said, I grew up in the desert. And so there were a lot of like seed pods <laughs> um, and, you know, uh, honey mesquite, delicious. Uh, you can just suck on that. It's a little bit sweet. Uh, you know, you can disperse the pods. There are wonderful things that you can do with those. Um, but, you know, and where I live now, there are pine cones and that those are, you know, different, beautiful things. And I, I always tell teachers, if you if you can't go out and find pine cones in your area, then don't bring them into your classroom. You want to really focus on on connecting children with the beauty of the spaces that you have where you are. So whatever that is. Um, lean into that and help children see the beauty in all of those spaces. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. So one of the things I really wanted to, to think about today is what are the ways that we weave giving thanks regularly into our curriculum? So, you know, we think about modeling gratitude and words of thanks for the trees, uh, not just to each other as human beings, but you know, while we're picking up the pine cones, while we're gathering acorns or finding sticks, we can, you know, model gratitude or, or words of thanks. Um, we can reflect on how a tree is giving us something when we're, you know, eating our snack and we say, this maple syrup is delicious. I wonder, you know, about this tree. How big was the tree that made this? Or, you know, these are very crunchy apples. I'm so thankful for the tree that grew these. Thinking about the ways that we can connect children really authentically to the gifts that children bring us. Um, and then helping children problem solve around ways that they can continue to give back. Some cultures give a physical offering, uh, tobacco or some type of herb. Um, but you can also, you know, do things like give the tree water when it's really dry outside. Or if you see a branch that's kind of broken and, you know, um, sagging down, you might say it might be time for this tree to get a haircut because that looks like it might be, you know, a little bit like it's pulling on the tree and it could make it, you know, get a little bit worse. So we can, you know, cut off a little bit. Um, treating, you know, and when we climb trees that we treat them with, uh, with respect and with kindness. We talk with our children about gentle climbing that we listen to the tree. And so it's kind of like when you're, uh, one of your grandparents is going to pick you up in their back is like, oh, if you hear the tree say things like, oh, that tree might not be, uh, might not be ready for what you're about to, to do. And so maybe uh, don't climb on that one or if it seems really soft. So we ask, we talk to the children about how to do that gently with trees and how to think about the trees, um, to listen to the sounds of the tree and respect those things. So any other ideas that you have, you should enter it into the chat about ways that you um, can regularly leave giving thanks for trees and other wildlife into your curriculum. And then in the book, there are special days where humans all over the world celebrate trees. So Arbor Day, Earth Day, um, like Jacqueline mentioned earlier, but what are other ways that you can weave in, um, you know, giving thanks for trees in your space? We often think about, we live, I live in a place uh, in Minnesota where there are seasons. And so just celebrating like uh, the blossoming of the trees or the falling of the leaves, that those are all things worthy of celebrating, kind of like a birthday party for a child. All right, next slide, please. So this one, I. I was uh, just thinking about what are the the things that we know about how much of uh, gifts children give to, or how much um, trees give to us. And I just thought about uh, kind of an, an activity that you could do. And I just called it like breathing in gratitude, thinking about centering yourself on the gift of air. And in the book, there are lots of ways that you can think about, you know, giving gratitude. Um, for, for the gifts that children or that trees give us. But um, this fact I thought was amazing that one tree produces about 260 pounds of oxygen each year. So, you know, two trees is enough for a family of four, which is great. We need more trees because uh, there are a lot of people, but, uh, but what are other ways that we can think about that? So um, you can enter into the chat. What are ways that you foster a sense of gratitude for trees? with the children that you work with? What can you do? So I just thought about an activity that we sometimes do 
Uh, we talk to the children about ways that you say thank you to people. Um, you know, you might give them a hug. Someone mentioned that in the chat. Um, how do you think you could say thank you to a tree? What do you think it would understand? Um, if you can learn the native language for thank you um, or for trees uh, in your area, that can be a wonderful thing. Um, in Dakota, they often talk about that the that the trees miss hearing those words um, because you know they a lot of our trees are very old and would have been here um, when people were still speaking that language more often. Um, and so we're trying to revitalize the language and we're also trying to give that gift to the trees. So you can take a walk with the children in your neighborhood um, and you know find a tree that, um, that everyone can connect with if you go for a walk in the woods and tell children about that these trees are making the air that we breathe in every day and take a few deep breaths with children and let them breathe that in and then just allow a moment for children to give thanks. Allow a moment for yourself to give thanks to what the trees do for us. And, you know, it can be verbally or physically, like we said, like a hug, or it can be just in your head. There are many ways that we give thanks. Um, and it doesn't always have to be just um, just through our words. So, so showing children um, that there are many ways to show gratitude. Next slide, please. And I just wanted to uh, bring in this, um, this po or this quote from um, Robin Wall Kimmerer's book. And, um, and it is the responsibility to the tree makes everyone pause before beginning. She talks about the honorable, honorable harvest in her book and, um, and just that meaningful and respectful gathering and creating things that are worthy of the life of a tree. So knowing that the, that the tree did give its life if you're producing wood things or that is giving a part of itself um, to create fruit and what are the ways that we respectfully gather and um, yeah, and just create uh, meaningful things from, from those products. So uh, that is it. That's what I brought for you today. And, um, and I'm excited to answer any questions. So uh, I'm, I will try and look through the chat. It was flowing pretty quickly, so I didn't see any questions. But if there are some, um, I'm happy to answer. And I know Tarnisha is um, happy to answer questions too. Thank you, Sheila. And thank you, Tarnisha. I just wanted to um, say I love how much engagement there is in the chat. There were not a lot of questions, but so much really wonderful sharing around ways to um, celebrate trees and give gratitude to trees in the ways that different programs and people do that. And I think that was really beautiful. So thank you for that prompt, because I really liked reading what everyone had to say. Um, I only really saw um, one question earlier, and it could be for either of you, both of you, for, for Jackie as well, about the resource um, Trees and Me and the age that it is geared toward, and also the activities that each of you um, sort of demonstrated today or went through today. Um, if there are suggestions for scaling up for like an older age or, or down um, and any suggestions you have, it's kind of a big question, but just if you want to share any, any thoughts about that, that would be great. You, you, you want this or me? Oh, oh, yes, I, okay, I'll take this one. You take the next one. <laughs> okay. So in the um, choosing me guy and, and also please chime in, um, Sheila. Um, yes, the ages, the, the guide is ages one through six, right? Yes, yes, one through six. And, and each for each activity, it, you can definitely adapt it. It actually gives you the breakdown on how to adapt it um, for, older, for older learners or younger learners. Chilling will help me. I think, is that right? Yeah, I think that that's exactly, yeah, right? Like, depending on what it is, always, of course, if there are children under three, thinking about things that are choking hazards is really important to think about. So we don't tend to use a ton of, you know, acorns with our one and two-year-olds, um, but as they get older and as you, um, 
you know, know who puts things in their mouth, especially when they're three year olds and older. Uh, I also think uh, thinking about the ways that you can make sure to keep these open um, and accessible for children with a wide variety of, you know, physical and, um, and developmental abilities is really important. So thinking about how much time do you need to allow when you like go for a walk or, or do you need to choose a place that has wheelchair access? Like, what are the ways that you can make sure to have these moments be really accessible for people? And then I think as much as you can, especially with this one to six age group, invite families to be a part of it, because it really is just going to help you, one, meet the needs of the child who is of a specific age, but also their development. And it will help keep any of those things that you have talked about kind of growing at home. Um, I think it, it is always great when, you know, children are talking about like sustainability or treating trees with respect or, you know, thinking about pollinators, that you have the families engaged in the conversation as well, because they're the ones who in a lot of places have the power to, to make a change. I don't know. I don't know if there were any other questions there. Oh. There was a specific question here. Sorry, I was trying to find my my unmute here um specifically what are some ways that you like to explain the scale of time in relation to how old some trees are yeah it, i think that that is a really hard thing especially for children you know four and under um they often don't even you know when they say yesterday it could be a year ago <laughs> or a minute ago um so time is is a really kind of hard thing um, for for very young children, but I think the older they get, you can talk about that. Like this tree was here when your grandma was a little kid. Um, we have some cottonwoods in our space that are, you know, over a hundred years old. And so we can talk about like this tree was here before this building, or you can show like old pictures of when that tree was a baby. We have some old like you know, in the like 50s and 60s, where they used to take those like aerial photographs of places. And we found a few of our space and it's like, oh, that one tree, that oak tree is still here. Um, and it can be really great to just talk about like, who was there, like before you were born, before your mom was born, before you're, you know, uh, anybody in your family, you know, these people in your family. Uh, and I think that that's a really wonderful way. I don't know if Tarnisha, you have another way to do it, but I usually focus it on something that children have a direct contact with, like someone in their family. And as far as like, um, I would immediately think about using tree cookies, but <laughs> with younger children and with, with, with speaking for the trees and me guy, I definitely wouldn't, I, I remember I used to put them in my science and nature center and I would just to keep it really simple for them because, and it was a different number every day. So I would just teach them to count the, light and dark rains because if you look at a tree cookie it'll tell you how old a tree is um well how old the tree was when it was cut and so let's just say the rains was it was 24 rains i mean you know it would be different every day but that was just a good way for children to know like hey this is a good way for you to know how old um this tree was when it was cut down i wouldn't go into the specifics of of the lighter rains mean this is uh it was what is it those are the, the summer months or the darker rings mean there was drought i just wouldn't go into I, i'm probably don't quote me on it i just said but i wouldn't go into the specifics but that's that's how i've done it in the past um i did see a question about sourcing for tree cookies but i think sourcing for anything keep it as local as you can and one of my favorite things is to look um, on my way to work for any trees that have a big orange X on them, that means that someone has decided that that tree is coming down. And so you can either call the city or call, you know, whoever is in charge of that area. If it's in a private person's yard, you can leave a note, um, but they always mark it with a big orange in, in Minnesota. They always mark it with a big orange X and we know it's coming down. And then I usually send a, a letter to the people who uh, are taking the tree down and say, hey, we'd like to have as much of that tree as you're willing to share with us. We'd be happy for small pieces or big pieces. Um, you know, we'd be happy to take, you know, up to nine foot logs that children can climb on. Um, and then we do try and find families that maybe have resources for cutting 
into tree cookies or something smaller because the places definitely won't do that part for you. Uh, but if you can find a, a family that, that can do it for you, that's really helpful. And then when they come fresh, they often aren't sanded like the nice ones that you could purchase at a store, but these are going to be better because you can connect them with the trees locally in your space. Um, but I just put them in a basket and then have little paper sanders that children can kind of sand it down to make it softer and that they can be part of making it into a classroom piece of curriculum. I love that. Thank you both. That's all the time we have for questions. Um, and I'm just going to quickly address to everyone that we are monitoring the chat, pulling out resources, pulling out some of those really wonderful comments about celebrating trees and gratitude. And there, um, it'll all be put up on the, the whole chat won't be shared, but we'll pull out those resources and put that um, up on the Natural Start website along with the recording. So just so everyone has that peace of mind that you'll be able to access all this great information later as well. Um, and with that, I'm actually gonna hand it back over to Jackie to wrap us up. All right, I'm going to send a big mahalo to our presenters, which is thank you in Hawaiian because I didn't know Sheila was in the islands. So mahalo to both of you. Um, we have an engagement question for the chat. If you want to reflect a little bit, how might you use the resources shared today? And we're going to share just a few more before we send you on your way in the last minutes we have left. Um, our friends here were sharing activities from PLT's Trees and Me Guide when they referenced the book. So Tarnisha shared excerpts from Home Tweet Home, which is activity 10, and you have a link right to that one um, with excerpts from that in the chat. And again, we'll be recirculating these in an email you'll get later. And then Sheila did Three Cheers for Trees, which is activity 12 to kind of close out our whole book after celebrating with the little ones, some things you can do to really express that gratitude. We have about a dozen appendices in this book that really help do some of the great things that Sheila and Tarnisha were talking about from woodworking and creating a woodworking center to doing music and movement with children. How do you use music uh, in outdoor spaces creatively, constructively? Uh, also diverse learners and diverse needs. So talking about uh, how you might adapt or modify, not only for age level, but people with cognitive um, things to consider or, or mobility um, elements you might want to think about. So lots of different things to really do our best to be inclusive and um, promote that outdoor environmental education for all. Again, uh, Christy shared the Natural Start Nature-Based Preschool Professional Practice Guidebook. So it's all the things. So PLT is like the activities, right? It's the content. But all the things you want to think about in early childhood programs, from administration to safety, to how you put these things together. So it has so much more than just like, what am I going to do now with these little ones, right? Which is what PLT is so good at and is why we're so amazing together. And so again, this document that really links the two to show that when you're doing this activity from PLT, it's supporting this practice that they have in the guidebook to really show that you're doing the best work and putting your best foot forward. So we've laid that groundwork for you. So there's links to all those resources and we can move on to the next slide. For those of you who aren't familiar with Project Learning Tree, it's all about creating a network for us. This is how Project Learning Tree works. We have a states-based and also international network of professionals that help us lead workshops everywhere, uh, whether it's virtual, whether it's online, and we have hybrid opportunities too. So if you're interested in getting the full book, there's so much you can access online, create your login, um, get in there. All of the student pages are there. We connect to families with family handouts. Um, again, we connect to music, we connect to um, mobility. So all, all of that stuff is in there and you can download it today. So just log on, but to continue your journey, please do reach out to your local PLT contact. So I'm uh, representing headquarters here, but we have PLT folks all over the state. So scan the link, visit the website to find out who your contact person is and get started. You can ask for more resources, more professional development opportunities like this one, anything they might have to take your next step on this learning journey. So today is just the beginning. With that, next slide, 
we want to hear about what you're doing. So both Project Learning Tree and National Start or Natural Start are on all kinds of social media. So please do tag us with your posts so you'll be thinking of us and we can share and promote and celebrate the amazing work you are doing with these little learners. So again, we have lots of resources here. We're going to connect you to in the chat, whether it's to you our trees in the book, more resources we have on the PLT website, how to become a member with Natural Start today. Again, that is free. Just please sign up so that you're getting all these resources. And then the map of where these nature-based pre preschools are popping up everywhere across the globe. Uh, so see where one is near you. Maybe you can partner with them. Maybe you already have already, or maybe you want to get your institution on that map so they can help you absolutely to do that and get started. So visit us online. And last but not least, we do have an evaluation for you. It's very quick. If you want to do it on your smartphone, you can scan that QR code. It's less than 10 questions. I think seven are on there. So just let us know how we did today, how we could change or modify things to help you even more. Again, remember, all of these resources are going to be shared. You're going to get an email. You will get the links uh, in case you missed something today. And of course, um, continue to engage with us online and feel free to open up that evaluation and do it right now. I know we are at time, but um, we do have 60 more seconds to spare for final thoughts from our practitioner presenters. If Tarnisha or Sheila, you would like to leave us with any parting thoughts, we would love to hear what you have to say. Sheila, do you um, want to go? Yes, of course. Hello, everyone. Um, <laughs> this is so exciting. And what I was just now doing was going through the chat. So many great resources. I would say, um, I hope that all of you are engaged in some sort of regional network in your space to both share what you know about getting children outdoors, but also just to learn about what how other people are using it. Um, I know Natural Start has um, some regional network groups that you can um, become a part of. In Minnesota, we have Manico. I know that Northern Illinois has NINPA. Um, so look on the Natural Start website and find a regional group to just continue to foster these ideas because um, they're so great. Uh, this has been really wonderful to hear from everybody. Thank you. Well, um, I just want to say that I'll share this, that um, inspire is my favorite word. And PLT has been inspiring me for a while. It's been a while. Um, 15 plus years I've been with PLT. So I just hope that P PLT inspires me and I hope that we inspired you guys. You guys have definitely inspired me to continue to do this work. Just reading through the reading through all the chat, the comments. Um, thank you guys so much. Bye. Thank you. Thanks everyone for your participation and happy Earth Day. My parting thought is just continue to reflect on yourself and your own learning journey as you continue to interact with these young people, but also consider how you can grow as a leader, as a learner, as a practitioner yourself. So with that, thanks for all the work you do. Thanks for joining us today and we hope to see you next time. You'll be hearing from us soon. Take care and happy Earth Day.